Welcome everyone to our Amazon Document DB Focus Day. Uh, before we jump into our content, we'd like to introduce ourselves. My name is Jason Plank and I'm a go-to-market specialist on the Document DB service team. I've been in the industry for about 20 years and have held various roles such as product management leader, development leader, and obviously my role at AWS now is a go-to-market specialist. Uh, at this point, I'd also like to pass uh, the microphone over to Doug Bonger, who will also introduce himself. Thank you, Jason. Uh, my name is Douglas Monster. I'm a senior document DB specialist solution architect. Um, I've been in the industry like Jason uh, over 20 years, uh, background in IT uh, development and also solution architect type of roles. Been working with document databases for six or seven years now, so very familiar with the space and uh, looking forward to uh, looking forward to talking to everyone here today. Excellent. Next, we'll, we'll uh, go through our focus day overall agenda. We'll start off today with the overall agenda for, for our focus day. Uh, we have a couple of different, different lectures as well as uh, a couple of different labs. Uh, we'll start with an introduction to Amazon Document DB. Uh, once we're done with that, we'll go through a uh, deep dive of Amazon Document DB, at which point we'll then get into a lab. Uh, and this is our introductory lab uh, where you'll get hands-on experience with with Amazon Document DB. Uh, following that, we'll go back into lecture and we'll cover uh, migrations to Amazon Document DB. And then we'll close off uh, the focus day with a uh, migration lab to Document DB uh, from MongoDB using uh, DMS. In our first section, I'll cover the introduction to Document DB, which will cover topics such as why Document DB, uh, an overview of the service, uh, some of our, rec our uh, recent releases, as well as uh, touch on our MongoDB compatibility. Uh, we'll close out with pricing and obviously some Q&A. As we get started, uh, it's important for us to, to level set and look across the AWS portfolio. We offer a broad set of databases and, and analytic services for our customers to lift and shift their database analytics workloads to the cloud. Customers are doing, it, are doing this at record levels across many of the multiple areas that you see here. For customers wanting to move away from self-managing Oracle, SQL Server, MySQL, and MariaDB databases, AWS offers Amazon RDS and Amazon Aurora. For customers wanting to move away from self-managed non-relational document and key, key value stores such as MongoDB, Redis, and Memcached, AWS offers DynamoDB, DocumentDB, and ElasticCache. For customers that want to move away from their expensive proprietary Teradata, Oracle, and SQL Server data, data warehouses, they're, they're moving to uh, Amazon Redshift. Customers that want to move their Hadoop and Spark deployments on-premise are doing are moving them to EMR for cost savings and the addition of having a managed having a managed service. For customers that want to move from their ElastiCache, Logstash, and Kibana, otherwise known as Elk Stack, on-premises solutions, they're moving to ElastiCache for cost savings and and ultimately as well having a managed service. We have real-time analytics for customers that want to move from their Apache Kafka deployments to Amazon Managed Streaming for Kafka. We'll start now with talking briefly, you know, about what is Document DB. Uh, in one of our next sessions, Doug is Doug Bonser is going to walk through some of the challenges of scaling on-prem databases. Uh, as we as we looked at those challenges, we also worked backwards from what our customers were asking for. Uh, in terms of a managed service when it comes to managing document documents. Uh, we built Amazon Document DB from the ground up. Just to be clear, we're not a drop-in replacement for MongoDB. We don't use Mongo source code. We are not taking a, you know, a Mongo version and, and wrapping a control plane around it. Uh, what Amazon Document DB is, is a fast, scalable, fully managed MongoDB compatible database service. Fast in that you can pro we can process millions of requests per second with millisecond latency. Scalable, as in we separate uh, we separate compute and storage, which which allows us to scale both scale both independently. We can scale out to 15 read replicas in minutes. We're fully managed, 
in that it's managed in that this service is managed by AWS. You have no hardware provisioning, no auto patching, you have quick setup, secure and automatic backups. As mentioned, we are a, Mongo, we are a MongoDB compatible service and we're compatible with the MongoDB 3.6 and 4.0 versions. We use the same SDK, you can use the same SDKs, tools and applications with Amazon DocumentDB. Overall, this is a purpose-built document database service engineered for for cloud and cloud scalability. Um, as you look across the industries and customers and ultimately market segments, you can see that we, we, we touch on and we have customers in a number of these different segments. Um, we have a lot of customers at this point running mature workloads on DocumentDB. The first, one we'll, first customer we'll talk about is one of our internal customers, which is obviously Amazon, fulfilled by Amazon. Complex documents that require nest, nested indexes, ad hoc queries, and aggregations. Woot replaced a, replaced a self-managed product catalog database running on Mongo 2.2 with Amazon Document D, DocumentDB. The Washington Post powers their publishing business and machine learning platform. They leverage the automated backups and multi-AZ failover for resiliency and scalability. And Samsung leverages DocumentDB's ability to have dynamic and changing schemas, and they were previously running on a relational database. Next, we'll get into document databases and talk about why document databases, use cases, and, and, and some example structure. So the first, the first question, or the first question to, to always, you know, that we like to cover is what is JSON? So JSON is a lightweight data interchange format. It's easy for humans to read and write, and it's easy for me, machines to parse and, gener parse and generate. JSON is a text format that is completely language independent, but uses conventions that are fit, conventions that are familiar to programmers of the C, C family languages, as well as Java, JavaScript, Perl, Python, and many others. These properties make JSON an ideal data exchange. JSON ultimately represents uh, data in two ways. One, an object, or, which is a collection of name, value, or key value pairs. And number two, an array, which is an ordered collection of values. To carry, to carry on now, why document databases? Data is stored in, in a JSON-like format, which is something that, that we just touched on uh, just a second ago. Um, the, this structure, uh, as I mentioned, maps naturally to how we think about modeling data in our applications. We don't typically mo model data in tabular format in our heads. We're thinking about groups of things instead. We also have flexible schema, schema and indexing. What exactly does that mean? Well, you can work with a dynamic schema that can change depending on your data needs and access patterns, and you have no need to, to design co a complicated rigid schema. Indexes can be created and dropped on in on demand and be declared on any value or any field within your documents, including fields nested with arrays. In order to add, add in order to provide ad hoc capabilities, uh, JSON has an extensive query language that's built for documents. You can re retrieve specific fields, values, and even regular expression queries. DocumentDB uses a JSON, JSON kind of query language, so it's very, very easy to learn. If you look across some of our, some of our industry use cases, um, you can see you know, content management, mobile, personalization, catalogs, retail marketing and user profiles. If you look at mobile, it's very easy to store data that you're collecting uh, and going back and back and forth between uh, especially you know back to that JSON format, uh, which which a lot of a lot of mobile apps are, are already leverage. In the case of cataloging, the whole idea is to is to be able to record an output of machine learning experiments, inventory descriptions, ph ph pharmaceutical trials, and, and et cetera. We see a broad set of customers that use documents for these use cases. In gaming, you can think of storing user profiles, game management, matchmaking, um, and really the overall, overall uh, life of your, of, your, of your gamer and your user profile. When it comes to retail and marketing, we're seeing use cases around tracking customers who purchase similar items, custom marketing campaigns, um, and also aggregation, so min, max, average. If you want to want to understand 
the output of, of your retail or, and or marketing campaigns. To get started, let's take a look at user profiles, for example. Let's say that Susan plays a new game called Exploding Snails. As you can see, you can easily add information to Susan's profile. Notice here that we didn't have to design a complicated schema or create any new tables. We simply added a new set of fields in our document. Similar, similarly, we can add an array for the promotions that Susan has achieved. So in this scenario, you can see that, that Susan achieved the new user promotion, 5%, and also a snail lover. The document model really enables developers to, enable, to evolve their applications quickly over time, again, without building rigid schemas. Next, we'll go into the service overview. As mentioned, Amazon DocumentDB is a fully managed document database service. In that, you have automatic recovery, recovery and failure. Replicas are automatically promoted to primary to give you a, a self-healing -heal service. We also provide automatic patching so that you can stay up to date with the latest patches. Maintenance windows happen every few months and you can choose the 30 minutes, 30 minute, 30 minute window. We also have a broad integration into existing AWS services such as CloudWatch, CloudTrail, CloudFormation, Secrets, Manager, VPC, IAM, as well as uh, CLI. We also have a pay-to-go page page pricing model, which really means per second, in, per second instant billing, no long, no long-term commitments, uh, and no, no upfront fees. You have the ability to stop and start uh, as you would like. Uh, as you're as you're using the service, one of our customers, Fresh Hop, who is a online grocery provider, in, enjoys Document DB's backup and scalability to help them manage their workloads. As mentioned, Amazon Document D is a MongoDB compatible 4.0 compatible service. Just to cover it again, we are not a drop-in replacement for Mongo. We are we did build, build this service from the ground up. With our service, you can use the same drivers and tools that you're, that you're using with Mongo with, uh, with Amazon Document DB. In terms of replica sets, read scaling is easy with automatic repli replica, replica set configurations. Document DB supports replica, replica, replica emulation, where our clusters appear to your drivers to be a MongoDB replica set, which allows you to use driver configuration to easily scale your reads. When you connect to a replica set, you can specify the read preference for the connection. If you specify a read preference of a secondary preferred, the client routes the read queries to your replicas and write, and write queries to your primary instance. This is, this is a better use of your cluster resources. And we'll get into more, to more, to more of the architecture and uh, reads and writes uh, as we go, th go through the deep dive session, which, which Doug will be conducting next. And Keto, one of our customers, does inventory automation for SMBs. They're happy with Document DB's quick, quick and easy ability to get started. From their point of view, everything just worked. The Amazon Document DB service is also scalable. And what exactly do we mean by that? Well, you can scale out in minutes. You can scale up to 15, min 15 read replicas. You can scale your instances up in your cluster so that you can scale from four to 768 gig gigabytes of RAM. We also have, we also, uh, when you look at our storage, which we'll dive dive deep uh, in our next next session as well, our storage automatically go grows from 10, 10 gig to 64 terabytes. What this what this really uh, eliminates is the need for complex uh, architectures when it comes to the back end storage system. When it comes to load balancing, Document DB allows you through replica set emu emulation to scale set scale reads across replicas quite easily. When it comes to security and compliance, what one of the things that we like to note is that it is a VPC only service. What that means is you have you are able to provide strict strict network isolation, and ultimately your cluster is not accessible from the internet. We we follow an encrypt by default policy, encryption at rest with AWS KMS and customer manage AWS keys, as well as encryption in transit with TLS. When it comes to safe defaults, clusters launch with the most secure defaults and you can optionally choose to modify these defaults if, if you choose so. From a compliance point of view, you can see that we have 
uh, P PCI DSS, ISO 9001, 27001, 27017, and 20, 27018, uh, as well as SOC2 and HIPAA, HIPAA eligible. When it comes to automatic backups, we provide automatic, incremental, and continuous backups. Automated backups are stored in S3 for 11.9's 11 11.9's durability and has no impact on your cluster performance. You can store your cluster at any time during your retention period of the last 35 days up until the last five minutes. We also archive snapshots and you can keep these snapshots as long as you would like. Um, cluster snapshots are user initiated backups of your cluster stored in S3 and they're kept as mentioned it, until you explicitly delete them. You can create a new cluster from the cluster snapshot whenever you desire. One of our customers, Iron, creates DevOps service serverless application tools to manage Docker containers. They're extremely happy with DocumentDB's backup performance and cost effectiveness. From a free feature release point of view, we're, we're always and, and very proud to say that we work backwards from our customers. Our goal is to make sure that we understand what a customer what a customer wants out of a managed service. And then ultimately we work with our customers to make sure that we meet those requirements and build those services uh, into, into our releases. As you can see, since December 2019, we have released a number of different product releases. In terms of our most recent releases, uh, in June of 2021, we launch global clusters. Uh, we also uh, continually launch a new aggregation ops as well as improved indexing. One of our big releases in, in uh, Q4 of last year was support for Graviton2 as well as a JDBC, JDBC driver for, for BI tools. So far this year, we've launched, launched, launched enhanced geospatial capabilities as well as some new some new operators, as well as a new document DB free trial. Um, in terms of free trial, your organization gets 750 hours per month of T3 medium instant usage, 30 million IOPS, five gig of storage, and five gig of backup storage for free for 30 days. Once your month free trial trial expires or your uses usage ex exceeds the free allowance, you can shut down your cluster to avoid any charges or keep it running at our standard on-demand rates. One major release that I'm gonna cover is support for MongoDB 4.0 compatibility, and this includes transactions. With this release, you're able to perform acid transactions across multiple documents, statements, collections, or databases, and you can think of uh, a bank account transaction at, for, as an example. Transactions simplify application development by, enab by enabling you to perform automatic, consistent, isolated and durable asset operations. Also in this release, we, la we launched the ability to use DMS or data Amazon's data migration services from MongoDB 4.0 to DocumentDB. Or you can use it to, to migrate from DocumentDB 3.6 to DocumentDB 4.0 uh, to take advantage of upgrade, upgrades or updates in, in our new release. With respects to performance and indexing, we launched the ability to use Hint as well as the Find and Modify API. We also added improvements to reduce overall index sizes. Updated operators is something that we that we do constantly launch to give ourselves uh, the ability to cover more use cases uh, for our customers that are ultimately looking uh, to consume uh, DocumentDB as a managed service for document databases. One of our other major releases came in, came in mid-2021, which was our global clusters release. We have two primary use cases for global clusters. One, the first use case is disaster recovery, whereby you can promote, promote your secondary clusters to primary for faster recovery in the event of regional failures. The second use case is data locality. This is helpful in use cases where you wanna bring your data closer to users in different regions, uh, which ultimately allows faster reads uh, for globally globally distributed applications. The next the next topic that I'll cover in this session is pricing. From a pricing point of view, we price in four different dimensions. The first dimension is instances. You're billed per second, but a, but with a 10 minute minimum, 
You also have the ability to mix and match different instance sizes, depending if you need more read, read scalability or write scalability. Uh, also, from an instance point of view, you can stop the cluster. Uh, as you stop the cluster, it will, it will also stop, stop your billing, and then it will restart automatically after seven days. The second area there that, we'll talk, that we talk about for pricing is I.O. When it comes to I.O., it's 20 cents per million, and these are, uh, these are essentially writes and reads. You can group, we offer the ability to group I.O. together, so the system's intelligent enough to group these operations together. For example, you're not writing in four 1K blocks and four different I.O. operations. We try to make one write I.O. It's very important to size your, your instances correctly so that you're reading as much data out of your working set cache and not fetching from storage causing IO operations. The next item I'll cover is storage. Storage is 10 cents a gig per month, and we only bill for one copy of your data. As Doug will cover in the next session, we do uh, write five additional copies so that, so that we offer a durable database service. So if you write 10 gigs, you're not getting you're not getting billed for 60 gigs. You're getting you're getting billed for your data set size, which was 10. When it comes to backups, backups have no impact on cluster performance and consume zero I/O or compute resources. 100 percent of your storage data is backed up for free. So if you have a 10 terabyte data set, you can back up all 10 terabytes for free. For any data that goes beyond your 10 terabyte data set. Uh, you will incur an additional backup cost of two cents a gig. Uh, as far as our next topic, next we'll talk briefly about migrations. Um, Doug, in our next, in one of our, as we covered off in the uh, original agenda up front, one of our sessions for that we will dive into is, in fact, migrations, where Doug will dive really deep into that topic. Um, when it comes to Amazon Document DB, we, we basically have three methods to migrate your data. Number one uh, is the offline method. It's the simplest method, but you incur, the, you incur longer downtime. So in this example, you can use Mongo Dump or Mongo Restore tools to migrate your data. Method number two to migrate data into Amazon Document DB is using the online migration using AWS DMS. This allows you for a near zero downtime migration. Uh, into Amazon Document DB. The third option is our hybrid method. The hybrid method merges the online and offline methods together. It does get a, a bit more complex. There are moving part, parts uh, because you will ultimately be using Mongo Dump and Mongo Restore to migrate data and then using DMS to replicate changes. But this is a method that we've seen several of our customers use and use uh, quite successfully. The last, the last topic that I have for the introduction into Amazon Document DB is a list of different programs and uh, investments that we've, that we've made uh, to ultimately make Document DB consumption easier for our customers. The first is cost analysis. So really what this is, it's a sizing questionnaire using your workload metrics to generate uh, a uh, cluster sizing estimate. The next is a compatibility assessment. The compatibility assessment is a self-service tool that you can use on your own. In terms of education and architecture and, and, my, and migration planning, we offer a, a number of different, uh, different programs. Um, no, one is an immersion day. An immersion day ultimately provides the customer with modular content and hands-on labs to learn about document DB use cases, architecture, architecture, best practices, migrations, security, monitoring, and more. These agendas can be customized depending on where you know where you are in terms of learning level uh, with Amazon Document DB. Another 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 program that we offer is a well architect well architected lens. Well architects the well architected lens for Document DB assesses your workloads with a focus on optimi optimizing performance, reliability, security, cost, and operational excellence. The output is that you get a well-architected review report with recommendations to ultimately optimize your workload. The next program that I'll talk about is Springboard. Springboard is a customized migration game plan that essentially allows uh, AWS to work with decision makers uh, to ultimately act as a sponsor and diverse stakeholders in your organization. We're essentially going to, going to work with you to take an assessment of your current state 
from an operations and business, business commitment point of view, as well as make spe specific architectural recommendations on AWS. Ultimately, the output leads to uh, some proposed milestones uh, as well as follow-up action so that we can we can work with the key stakeholders uh, in your in your organization uh, to, to help with planning uh, and executing against your migration. The next program that we offer is our uh, document DB data labs. In this example, we we ultimately provide technical resources and we'll work with customers to build tangible deliverables that accelerate data 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 modernization initiatives. Customers who built DocumentDB POCs are given pres prescriptive architectural guidance, best practices, and technical roadblock removal by AWS Data Lab engineers and DocumentDB experts. Uh, the outcome to you is a well-architected -archi well DocumentDB prototype with a path to production. We've seen this be really successful to help, to help jumpstart migrations uh, and ensure uh, successful migrations as you build a prototype uh, with with the data labs team. The last option is our the last program that we have is we we also have a dedicated professional services team. This professional service teams aligns with your business to ensure that you're that you're meeting your outcomes, your business outcomes and objectives uh, and helps to remove any challenges uh, that come along the way. Ultimately, the professional service TV team can work with you in a number of different scenarios to, to drive a number of different outcomes whether it's optimization, migration, uh, or just general consumption. That concludes our set first session, which is which was the introduction to Amazon Document DB. Next up, Doug will, Doug will dive deep into our Amazon Document DB service, and then uh, following that, we will jump into a lab. Doug, take it away. All right, thank you, Jason, for that uh, introduction to DocumentDB. And uh, as you said, all right, we'll be uh, diving deep into the service now. Uh, and in this session, I'm going to cover some of the challenges scaling traditional database deployments and then really dive deep into the architecture of Amazon DocumentDB and show you how we address those challenges. So what are some of the challenges in scaling traditional databases? Right. When we talk about traditional databases, right, it's, it's uh, relational databases you're very familiar with, and even some NoSQL databases, in that they use an architecture that's monolithic. So to illustrate that, on the left side of this slide, uh, you see a client application at the top connecting to uh, a database server. And that database server is actually a, a monolithic architecture here with different layers uh, of the database all on the same physical server. So you see here the API layer that handles requests from the client application. Uh, then you see a, a query processor which converts those API calls from the application into queries that the database can understand and execute. Then you see a caching layer that typically is going to be caching the data stored in the database for faster response times for the application. Uh, the logging layer uh, that's keeping a, a history of the actions executed on the data. And then lastly, at the bottom there, you see the storage layer, which is going to write the data to and read the data from the attached storage. So uh, this is not a cloud native architecture. So some of the challenges when moving these kinds of databases to the cloud, uh, you know, you typically see multiple monolithic servers network together which in turn leads to a number of challenges that I'll talk about now. So the first challenge with this type of architecture is adding read capacity to the database on demand. So let's talk about these challenges in the context of a product catalog use case. Right? In that use case, the data is relatively static and doesn't change very frequently. If you are adding products, uh, certainly you'll add more data to the database. Right? But as your business grows, uh, ideally, right, you want to see more and more clients accessing your systems and your data. So you need to read uh, more clients are going to need to read that product catalog. So you're going to need to add more read capacity. In a monolithic architecture, the only way to get that additional read capacity is to, to add a new node. Like you see here, we've added a, a node four to this uh, initial three node cluster. 
Now, because of the architecture, again, a monolithic architecture, each node has a local copy of the data. So in this case, the new node you added for additional read capacity is gonna need a copy of that data too. So the way we do that is data is replicated from one of the existing nodes to that new node. Uh, and that's gonna take some time. Certainly the more data you have, the longer it takes. And that's also gonna affect the performance of the source node. All right, resources on that node that could be handling reads and writes from the application are now going to be used to replicate data to that new node. The second challenge is recovering quickly from a node failure. Uh, so here you see in this scenario, node three has failed in our three uh, node deployment. So to recover, you're gonna need to add a new node to replace the failed node. But then you run into the same issues that we saw with adding read capacity. All right, so the replacement node is gonna need a copy of that data. How do you get that? Well, the data needs to be replicated from one of the existing nodes to the new node. It's gonna take time, which is dependent on how much data there is. And that's gonna further reduce the performance of an already impacted database cluster because resources on node two are now needed to replicate the data to the new node. The third challenge is around scaling storage as your data grows. So remember in the context of a catalog or product catalog use case, right? Over time, you're adding new products. Uh, if you consider a, uh, what we call a bare metal deployment, right? This may be a self-managed uh, scenario where you're managing the data uh, a database on a single server, right? And in that case, you're gonna have some hard drives attached directly to that database node to store the data. So if your product catalog grows in size, you need scaled storage. So that could mean either physically removing existing hard drives from that physical server and installing new larger drives, uh, or in the case of monolithic databases running in your Amazon virtual private cloud, uh, you're gonna need to resize your elastic block store or EBS volumes, which again is, is non-trivial. But either way, all right, you're going to reach a point where there's either not going to be disks big enough uh, or you can no longer scale your EBS volumes to store the entire data set. And the fourth challenge is around backup. Right? So how do you backup data without affecting performance? So in uh, traditional monolithic architectures, common approach is to use one of the operational nodes or the nodes handling the, uh, the operational read and write traffic, right? using one of those nodes to create a snapshot of the data. Well, that's going to affect the performance of that node. Right? Resources that could be handling requests from the client application are now being used to, to back up data. So to address that, a lot of times what we see is uh, add an extra node, a backup only node to handle the backups. All right, so with this approach, yes, there's no impact to that operational node, but you do incur additional cost because now you've got an extra node to pay for. And sometimes you'll incur additional cost for a license for that node as well. And then the final challenge, the fifth challenge I wanna to discuss today is around data durability. So when I talk about data durability, that's really concerned with data redundancy, right? having multiple copies of the data so that data is never lost or compromised. Uh, in traditional architectures, an easy way to achieve that is by simply having additional copies of the data, meaning additional nodes. Uh, since the data is local to the node, right, there's really no way to increase the durability of the data without adding more compute resources. So as you see here in this diagram, you, know, you can't have three copies of the data without having three separate nodes with these kinds of architectures. Okay, so now that you understand you know, five of the common challenges we see scaling traditional databases, uh, for the rest of the session, I'm gonna dive deep into the Amazon Document DB architecture and show you how we address those challenges. Okay, so you know, here's that stack, right, that you saw earlier with the API, the query processor, the caching, the logging, and the storage. Uh, now, when we set out to architect a cloud native database service, uh, the first thing we did is we decided to decouple the compute and storage layers. All right, so the compute layer has the APIs, API handling, the query processor, the caching, storage layer has logging and storage itself. And now because of the separation of compute and storage, that allows you to scale compute and storage independently of each other and provides a lot of really interesting and unique benefits that 
help to address these challenges that we just talked about. So just to, to level set, let's take a closer look at this cloud native architecture, right? We just saw a very high level separation of compute and storage, but uh, digging into a little deeper here, you see the compute layer at the top, the storage layer at the bottom. Uh, and in document DB, the compute layer, all right, your compute layer is up to 16 instances distributed across three availability zones in an AWS region. Uh, we support instance sizes, uh, small instance sizes with two vCPUs and four gig of RAM, all the way up to 96 vCPU and 768 gig of RAM. All right, so you've got a lot of options uh, for the instances in your compute, compute layer. Uh, important to understand there is always a single primary instance in an Amazon Document DB cluster, and that primary instance is what handles all of the writes. Uh, you can also use it for uh, immediate read consistency requirements. Right? If you've got to uh, uh, have immediate consistency, uh, read your own write type of consistency, you can do that with the primary instance. But typically, primary instances are, are used for writing data. And then the best practice is to scale out replica instances or those read replicas to handle additional read traffic. Again, up to a total of 16 instances in a document DB cluster. That the storage layer, right? The storage layer is a distributed storage volume, right? So it's not just a single large uh, hard drive or anything out there. It is a distributed storage volume. Uh, it can automatically scale from 10 gigabytes all the way up to 64 terabytes in size. And it provides highly durable storage with six copies of the data across three availability zones. So as you see in the diagram, we've got you know, a couple of different colored boxes down there, but you'll see there's like six yellowish boxes and six sort of greenish boxes, right? To, to help convey the point of that six copies of the data across the three availability zones. Now, key thing to understand, and I'll talk about it a little bit more, is no matter how many instances you have in the compute layer, whether you've got the maximum of 16 instances or one or potentially even no compute instances, all right, that data is always replicated six ways across those three availability zones for that highly durable storage of your data. Okay, so. Now let's dig into those five, same five challenges, right? And I'll talk about how Document DB handles and addresses those challenges for you. So again, in the context of that product catalog use case, right, so if you're running your product catalog on Amazon Document DB, all right, you may just start with a single instance right, so that you can scale up as needed, right? Maybe you're just starting out. So here you see a single instance uh, Document DB cluster. Now, as your business grows, right, you can easily scale the compute layer by adding, in this case, a read replica. And now because of that separation of compute and storage, right, there's no need to replicate the data set to that new read replica. If you remember uh, in the previous set of slides, right, you add a new uh, read replica, you've got to copy all the data so that read replica has it. Because the data is all in the distributed storage volume, it's simply a matter of standing up a new instance. And you can add up to 15 read replicas in a matter of minutes, right? It's typically eight to 10 minutes. Uh, it's a conservative time estimate. And it's frequently lower than that, all right? But we tell, we tell customers to figure on eight to 10 minutes to, to add those read replicas. And again, this is regardless of the amount of data that you've got in the database because you're only creating new compute instances. No data is being replicated. No data has to be moved. So in addition to adding read capacity that we just saw or scaling out on demand, you can also scale up on demand. Uh, so in some cases we see customers scale up one of their instances to run maybe complex analytical workloads. Right? In this case, you can see one of the uh, replica instances it has been scaled up to uh, a little bit larger size, right? from an R6G large to an R6G 2X large. All right. Now, again, because of the separation of compute and storage, there's no need to replicate the data to the new larger read replica. And then when you no longer need that for those analytical workloads, they can be scaled back down. Uh, we also see customers scaling their entire cluster up during peak hours and then scaling it back down. Again, the architecture allows you to accomplish this without worrying about how long it's going to take because of that separation, no movement of data. So now you can scale up and down in a matter of minutes, regardless of the amount of data stored in the database. 
and then finally, with the separation of compute and storage, if you take it to its extreme, right, you can actually shut down or remove all of the compute instances in your cluster. Right? And this is typically going to be done in like dev and test environments where you don't need those instances up and running while nobody's working. Right? So you can actually remove all of those compute instances, but you still have highly durable storage of six copies of the data across the three availability zones because the storage is separated from the compute. Uh, the second challenge, if you remember, was quickly recovering from node failure. All right, so with document DB, you can quickly recover from node failure. And he, in this example, you see that the primary instance has failed. So what document DB will do is if you have additional instances, right? This is why we recommend at least two instances in any production cluster. All right, so if you have an additional instance in the cluster, failover is typically going to be you know, about 30 seconds, again, regardless of the amount of data. So within 30 seconds, we detect one of the, the, the instances. In this case, the primary is unavailable. We promote uh, a replica to become the new primary uh, all within 30 seconds. And then after the failover, the service is going to manage uh, standing up a new replica instance to bring the cluster back to full strength. But again, you know, all of that uh, is going to take about 30 seconds to fail over and have a cluster where you can continue to write and read. And then within 8 to 10 minutes, you'll have a cluster that's back at full strength. Challenge three was around scaling, all right? Scaling storage as your data set grows. So if you remember talking about our product catalog use case, right, over time, you, you add more products, more product lines, you've got more data to store. Uh, but document DB allows you to easily scale storage as your data grows. Uh, and actually, storage scaling is automatic in, in document DB. That distributed storage volume can automatically scale from a minimum of 10 gigabytes to a maximum of 64 terabytes with no user interaction. All right, so effectively, as you add more data to the database, that distributed storage volume is going to grow automatically for you to accommodate that data with no interaction on your part. That fourth challenge was around backing up data with a without affecting performance. Right, so document DB allows you to do that, allows you to back up your data without affecting performance. Uh, and because as you can see in this diagram, there's no compute layer, right? I took the compute layer out. Uh, main reason is compute instances do not participate in backups, right? You don't have to uh, you have a, a dedicated instance for backups or worrying up about backups consuming resources on your compute instances because backups are handled entirely by the storage layer. And the backups that we provide in document DB, you see two different kinds here, continuous backups and snapshots. All right, continuous backups, uh, as the name implies, just continuously throughout the day. Right, the, the service is backing up data to Amazon Simple Storage Service, or S3. And those can be used for point-in-time recovery right, to, uh, with a, a RPO of up to five minutes prior to, to the current time. Right? So if you need to restore to anything past five minutes before right now, all right, you could leverage those point-in-time uh, recovery with those continuous backups. Snapshots, this is a full backup of the data. Uh, that you can have automated snapshots as well as manual snapshots uh, that you initiate. So I talked about the storage layer streaming those changes to Amazon S3 and the incremental backups for point in time recovery, full backups for faster restore times. Uh, so the default of the service is, is one day worth of backups, right? You actually cannot turn off backups in document DB. Uh, so that's why when Jason was talking about the pricing with 100% of your data is free, all right, to really strongly encourage backups of at least one day's worth of data uh, or 100% of your data set, all right, that's all done automatically for you, actually can't be disabled. Uh, if you de do need more uh, data you know, to, to have a, a R, a RPOs past one day, you can go out to 35 days with the um, automated uh, snapshots and backups and manual backups. Of course, you can keep those for as long as you need if you need to extend past 35 days. 
But again, the main point here is all of this is handled by the storage layer, zero impact to the compute layer, therefore zero impact to <clears throat> your operational workloads from the applications. Okay, and then the last challenge, I'm spending the, the bulk of the time here because it's, it's really key to understand how we do this here, is around data durability. So again, data is highly durable with just one, uh, or as you saw, even no instances in the compute layer, right? But, but here we have one instance. And with a single instance, uh, talk a little bit about availability. With a single instance, you're gonna have two nines of availability, uh, mainly because it's gonna take about eight to 10 minutes to recover from an instance failure. Right? You don't have any other replicas that could be promoted to a primary. So single instance clusters are typically used for uh, dev and test environments. Right, but again, data is highly durable. Six copies of the data across those three availability zones. Uh, with two compute instances, you're going to have three nines of availability. Right, because in this case, uh, in the instance of a primary fail failure, failover is typically going to complete in, in 30 seconds, as we saw a little earlier. And two instance clusters are typically going to be used in production environments that maybe don't have very high read requirements, right? Maybe it's a, a relatively low uh, read rate uh, application. So sometimes we see two instance clusters being used for those. Uh, three instance clusters is gonna give you four nines of availability. And this is the default. <clears throat> if you create a document uh, DB cluster, uh, through the console, you'll see that three instances uh, is the default, and it is recommended for production deployments. And again, in the case of a primary instance failure, failover is typically going to complete in 30 seconds. As I mentioned, you can scale out. So with four or more compute instances, you know, do be aware you're still only going to have four nines of availability, right? Because the compute instances are still deployed across uh, three availability zones in the region. So additional uh, replicas are not going to increase your availability, right? But you will use that for read scaling, right, as we previously talked about. All right, so how, how do we actually replicate the data to achieve this durability, All right? So we saw just some high level, you know, different cluster configurations with one, two, three, and four uh, compute instances. Uh, but let's dive a little bit deeper into how we actually achieve this high durability. Right, so uh, comparing it to, to MongoDB, right? It's Amazon Document DB with MongoDB compatibility, right? So in Document DB, all updates are equivalent to MongoDB updates that have a, a write concern of four and journal equals true. So what does that mean? All right, so basically all that means is that every update in document DB is going to require that four copies of the data are persisted to the distributed storage volume before that update is considered successful. All right. And then all of the replication, as we'll see here in the subsequent slides, is handled by that storage layer. All right. So just walk through an example. Application inserts a new document into the database, right? connects to the primary instance using the MongoDB uh, SDK. All right. It calls the insert API to insert a JSON document that's sent to the primary instance. All right. The primary instance is then going to um, send that to the storage layer, to the distributed storage volume, and that update, that change is going to be replicated across those three availability zones uh, in an animation here. But initially, right, the first copy in this example is written to availability zone one. Here we see the second copy is written to availability zone two. Uh, the third copy is written to availability zone three, and in this case, fourth copy is written to availability zone two. Now, at this point, all right, we've achieved that right quorum of four, right? I mentioned that right quorum of four, four copies of the, of the change being written. So after those four copies of the change have been written to the distributed storage volume, the primary instance will send an acknowledgement back to the client that the update is successful. And then at that time, after the uh, success uh, acknowledgement is sent back to the application, the primary instant is, instance is going to replicate uh, that change data to the replica instances in the cluster so that they can update their cache uh, with the updated data. Uh, I do want to point out, right, the service is smart enough that if the replica instance is not 
currently caching that data, we're not going to pollute the cache with those changes. Right? So it's only ultimately going to be replicated to any instances that were already caching that data. So at the same time, as the changes are being replicated from the primary instance to the replica instances for caching purposes, the storage layer is going to continue to replicate the data to maintain those six copies of the data across the three availability zones. As you see here, right, we've got two copies in each availability zone. And again, because all of this uh, replication of the data uh, on storage is handled by the storage layer, those replica instances are, are freed up to handle client requests uh, there's no real, um, not much consumption of resources on those instances other than updating their caches. Now, because of this uh, highly durable storage across the three availability zones, we say that document DB is availability zone plus one resilient. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, so let's walk through a scenario here. Now, uh, a little bit deeper you know, under the covers of the distributed storage volume, uh, data is stored in 10 gigabyte segments. Right? So uh, it's really the entire segment which is replicated six ways across these availability zones. Right? So each segment may actually contain you know, multiple documents. Right? So they're not individual documents, but these 10 gigabyte segments. Now, so if one availability zone happens to go down, all right, document DB can still achieve that right quorum of four, right? Four copies of the data. All right, so because we have two availability zones, we can still update those four copies of the data required for that primary instance to send the acknowledgement back that the right operation was successful. Read operations, uh, they only require a quorum of three meaning they only have to be able to, to read from three of those copies. So in this case, read operations will not be impacted either by the loss of an availability zone, All right? So sum it up with the way our architecture is, even if you lose an availability zone, your data is still able to be read and written in Amazon Document DB. Now, if at the same time, another copy or segment of the data in another availability zone is lost, right? That being the plus one. Right? Now, at this point, document DB can no longer achieve the right quorum, so you won't be able to. Um, it will not be able to handle updates at that time, but it is still available for reads because we can still achieve the read quorum of three because we do have three segments that are currently available to read from. And then the recovery from this uh, scenario is really the amount of time it takes to copy a 10 gigabyte segment over the network to rehydrate another copy of that storage. And that mean time to recovery is obviously going to be magnitudes, orders of magnitude faster than traditional monolithic database architectures where you need to move the entire data set to recover from a failure. Okay, so in summary, right, you've seen five of the common challenges scaling traditional database deployments and how Document DB addresses these challenges. And really, it goes back to the architecture, right? The cloud native architecture with the separation of compute and storage layers, right? And just to, you know, to, to drive home and sum up those five things there, right? That separation allows you to one, quickly add read capacity on demand. Right, within eight to 10 minutes, you can have additional read replicas, no data movement required. Uh, you can quickly recover from node failure. Right, if you have more than one instance, all right, that recovery is going to be on the order of about 30 seconds. All right, and then another eight to 10 minutes to get your cluster back up to, to full capacity. Right, the, it allows you to automatically scale storage as the data grows with no interaction on your part. It's going to allow you to continuously back up data without affecting performance. And it's going to allow you to achieve that high data durability no matter how many compute instances uh, you have in the cluster. 
so uh, you know, in terms of what's next, uh, some things that uh, you can look into or refer back to after this session, the first link here, a resources link that has uh, links to our developer guide, to different white papers, blogs, videos, and a lot of other information about Document DB. And the second link here is the workshop, which actually you will be doing two of these workshop modules, one uh, immediately following this presentation session here. Uh, but there are other modules and they're self-paced hands-on labs that cover things uh, like an introduction to the service, right? How do you create a cluster? How do you migrate data? How do you monitor it? Uh, security, things like global clusters. Jason mentioned that global clusters feature that we introduced last year and archiving data with a, a feature that we call change streams. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention on this presentation. And at this point, we'll move into the first hands-on lab, which is the introduction to Document DB Lab. All right, so I wanna thank everybody again for joining this session today. And what we're gonna do now is transition into some, some hands-on uh, with Document DB in an environment that we've already got created for you. So we'll be doing this for about 20, 22 minutes and we'll go back to some, some more recorded content. Um, so you should see, uh, if not already, uh, you should, momentarily see uh, some information uh, in connect uh, with a link to the event login page and i'll show you what that looks like here you'll you'll come to a page like this all right and another link is the documentation for for the the hands-on lab all right, that's going to bring you to to this page. So I'll just start through start with this, walk through it briefly. So we are using uh, what we call Event Engine, where we host these events. All right, so you can use these free of charge. These environments are going to be available until Thursday morning, about 8 a.m. Central. So you've got about three days. Uh, so if you don't finish these two labs, you can continue to work on them, or you could work on any of the other labs in the workshop. All right, but once you get to this page, go ahead and click on this link to enter the code. All right, so you'll go to a screen like this, and there has been a hash code that was shared in the uh, in the Chime chat as well. So go ahead and and paste that uh, paste that code in there. Uh, it's the event hash. It starts with six F A D. So once you once you paste that in you will see a screen where you are uh, provided some options to, to sign into the event. Uh, I typically recommend the one-time password. You know, if you do happen to be an Amazon employee, you could use that third option, um, but you could use the one-time password. Uh, you'll provide an email address, and then with typically within maybe 10, 10 to 30 seconds at most, you'll get an email uh, with the one-time password token that you can use uh, to access the, the event. So once you've got all of that entered, all right, once you've chosen, chosen your, your method to access it and you've provided the credentials or the one-time password token, uh, you'll come to a screen that, that looks like this. Okay, so let me just go ahead and pause for, for a few moments to give folks a chance uh, to, get to get to the screen here. Okay, so if again, if you have any issues, go ahead and certainly reach out via chat in, in Connect and we will be able to assist you there. But once you've, once you've gotten uh, access, you'll go ahead and click on this button to access the AWS console. 
right? And then you will be taken to a screen that, that looks like this, okay? So what I'm gonna do is just uh, give you a highlight of what you'll be doing in this lab. So if you go back to the, um, to the lab guide link, let me bring that up here. Just go ahead and once you get in, go ahead and click on this introduction to Amazon document DB uh, portion of the of the workshop guide. And I'm gonna kind of kind of go through this a little quickly, but what you're gonna be doing in this portion of the lab is setting up an Amazon document DB cluster. So it's just a single instance cluster. And then a little bit later in the lab, you'll scale it out to a three instance cluster, uh, but you'll, you'll follow through uh, the steps here. And this, this gives you a um, high level view of what you're building out. All right, so you have an Amazon Document DB cluster running in uh, a VPC. And then we're using the Cloud9 uh, IDE, Integrated Development Environment, to access that Document DB cluster with uh, Mongo Shell and the Py Mongo Python uh, Mongo drivers. And then you're accessing that uh, Cloud9 IDE through your through your browser. All right, so that's just a, a high level overview uh, of the solution here. And then I right, just get right into creating uh, an Amazon Document DB cluster. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and walk through this here. So you can see, so go ahead once you get to the console, click on the link for Amazon Document DB. Uh, if it's not showing up, all right, you can just go ahead and search for it up here in this search box by services. Let's go ahead and select Amazon Document DB, and you'll see that you already have a cluster that's been created as part of the environment uh, that we made for you. Or well, we're going to create a new one just so you can see uh, the steps that you need to go through to create one, and it's pretty straightforward. So you go ahead and click the Create button and provide an identifier and just use the uh, information provided in the lab guide. So we're calling this demo document DB. Uh, we're using the document DB 4.0 engine for the instance class. Uh, since this is just for some simple uh, testing, we're gonna go with a T3 medium, which you note here is eligible for a free trial. Right? So we do have a free trial available for document DB. So you can get your hands on with it uh, for that free trial period. And, not have to pay anything for the use of it. But go ahead and pick a T3 medium instance. And we're just gonna use one instance in this case, because again, we're going to scale it out as part of this first lab. So the next thing you need to provide are the master credentials. I have the, think of this as the master admin login to your document DB cluster. And again, use the credentials provided in the lab guide uh, because uh, the lab guide is written to uh, use these credentials. So if you change it to something else, uh, you're gonna have to remember what that is and, and make the appropriate changes as you go through. But just stick with the, uh, the defaults and you will be fine. So the next thing that you're going to do is go into some of the advanced settings for the cluster. So we're going to choose the, the VPC or the virtual private cloud where we want to deploy uh, this cluster. Again, because mainly because the labs are uh, written based on the assumption that the cluster is going to be in a VPC named labs-vpc. Uh, the subnet group has been chosen for you automatically. Right? And that's just the subnets in the, the different availability zones in this VPC where the compute instances will be created. Uh, specify the security group, right, to uh, what, um, what security groups and basically what um, access you're going to allow for this cluster. So we're going to use a security group that already has been created called DocDB Inbound and turn off the default security group. And the rest of the information here you can leave uh, at the defaults. And I'll go through these uh, in a little bit more depth in an existing cluster while we wait for this cluster to be created. So again, provide the identifier, um, T3 medium instance class, one instance, the master credentials, labs of EPC, and then the DocDB inbound security group. 
Let's go ahead and click on create. And this is gonna take about, about five, five minutes or so. You know, typically we say eight to 10 uh, at most. Uh, I think for this lab, this probably takes around five minutes. So while we're waiting for this cluster to be created, um, just want to go ahead and show you some of the, uh, some other capabilities and other uh, options that you have here in the console on a existing document db cluster uh, so i'm into the, in this getting started with document db cluster that was created as part of this lab uh, if you click on it you can go to a summary page you can just get a quick overview the cluster is available i've got three instances they're all available there's no maintenance pending on this cluster uh, and the cluster is in sync with the uh, the cluster parameter group. Uh, we're not really going to get into cluster parameter groups in this lab, but um, it's a way to specify options on the cluster. Like, do you want TLS enabled or disabled? All right, it's enabled by default. If for some reason you want to disable it, you would go ahead and change it in the parameter group right? and that the, the cluster would have to um, basically be in sync with those uh, parameter group settings. So if you did change something, for example, all right, TLS uh, encryption, all right, you would see here if the cluster still needed to get synced up with those changes. The connectivity and security tab is gonna give you all of the information you need to connect to the cluster. So in the, here we see, first of all, a link to download uh, the certificate that you're going to use to, to connect to the cluster here, this wget command. Uh, if you're gonna connect via Mongo shell, here's the connection string you would use. And for an application, here's the connection string that you would use with the, uh, which whatever driver you happen to be using in your code. Again, in this case, we're using the Pi Mongo driver. Okay. So with that, let's go ahead and take a look at our instances. Uh, this is a three instance cluster. You can see the name of the three instances, the class. In this case, there are five large. Uh, you can see which one is the primary. In this case, it's getting started with document DB2. In your case, it's probably going to be a different instance. Um, and we see that they're all available. Now we can see the configuration, right? So the information that you provided when you created the cluster, you'll you'll see that here, along with some other uh, other information like the the ARN, the time it was created. Again, here's the cluster endpoint. Here is the the reader endpoint. All right, we we recommend always using the cluster endpoint, but if you want to connect directly to uh, the reader endpoint for there are some circumstances where you may want to do that. Uh, that's the reader endpoint there. Uh, the master username port information. And over on the right hand side, see our information about backups. All right, it, it is enabled. In this case, it's configured for a seven day retention period. Remember, you get uh, one day's worth of backup retention for, for free. Uh, and that tells you the based on the configuration, what's the earliest restorable time and the latest restorable time based on the, the backups that exist, uh, what your backup window is, uh, what the maintenance window is, and security information. Uh, monitoring tab, uh, there's over 50 different metrics available uh, through Document DB. So the monitoring tab is, is one way to see these. And they're grouped in categories like resource, utilis like resource utilization, right? the distributed storage volume, right? how many bytes are being used, uh, store, uh, backup storage volume, CPU utilization, uh, freeable memory uh, on the, in the cluster, number of database connections, number of cursors. Uh, there's throughput category, right? how many read IOPS and write IOPS. What's the network throughput, the write throughput, the read throughput, uh, latencies? All right, what's the uh, cluster replication lag? All right, so the time it takes to replicate changes from the primary uh, to the secondary or secondary instances. All right, what's that replication lag look like? Uh, operations, right? How many uh, deletes? How many gets? How many inserts? How many updates? You know, they're all zero right now because we're we're not doing anything yet. We will shortly. And the last is a system. 
All right, so buffer cash hit ratio, index buffer cash hit ratio. All right, if you remember that cash is in the uh, in the compute layer, all right, and we cache data and index information there. So the higher that is, right? Ideally, you want that to be uh, 100, meaning everything is able to be read from the from the cache on the instance. All right, so let's see here how we're doing. If that cluster is created. Okay, yep. Yeah. So that new cluster is created. So now we're going to um, do a little, a little, uh, or have a little interaction with the cluster via the Mongo shell and via a Python uh, application. Okay. So first, um, what you will do is go to the Cloud Nine. service uh, within the AWS console. All right, always, you'll already have an environment, this Labs Cloud9 IDE. And go ahead and open that IDE. And that'll take a few minute, few moments to open it. Uh, first time you access, it's going to start the underlying EC2 instance. Uh, so this takes maybe about a minute or so. Uh, but once this is started up, you'll go in and uh, do some setup on this um, Cloud9 IDE so that you can interact with your document DB cluster. All right, so right, mine has started up. I'm going to go ahead and create a new terminal window. And in the lab guide, uh, you'll see a step there for retrieving the document DB cluster uh, password. So where I am now is all right, we created the cluster and about to, to query the cluster with the Mongo shell. And I'm at this connecting to Amazon document DB portion of the lab guide. Right, so one of the first things you'll do is just echo an environment variable to make sure everything got uh, created correctly. And I missed a step. Okay, <laughs> sorry about this. Um, I really apologize here. So at the very end of the prerequisites, so we'll go back to that very first link that was provided into the lab guide, and you'll need to configure the Cloud9 environment. All right, this gives you another way to get into the Cloud9 IDE. Uh, you can go to the Cloud Formation Console, or like I did, you can just go to uh, ser the services search box, type in Cloud9, and you'll see the, the Cloud9 IDE there. But there's a, a couple of commands you need to run once you get into the Cloud9 IDE. And you see them here. There's a wget. We're going to execute this script that we downloaded through the wget and then uh, store some environment variable settings into our into our uh, bash um, settings here. So go ahead and copy, copy those commands, paste them in, and this is going to download uh, Mongo shell. It's going to download PyMongo. It's going to da download a, 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 a script, this init.sh that we run. This is going to take maybe about a minute or so. And once that is done, will be in good shape. Again, I apologize for uh, for missing that first step there. Hope it didn't throw anyone off too much. Okay. So that script, uh, the script has been downloaded and run. So now go back to, to the lab guide, uh, copy this command to echo the password environment variable. All right, and we see now that it is, it's the time to change, All right, again, based on what you entered when you first created the cluster. So when you walk through here, uh, first thing you're going to need to do is get the um, connection string for this demo document db cluster that you created. 
So the way the way that you do that is go back to the list of clusters in document DB. Uh, you see the demo dash document DB cluster. And remember, remember when we looked at the getting started cluster, the very first thing is this connectivity and security information. All right, so similar, the first thing that you're going to see when you click on the uh, demo document DB cluster are the connect strings. So go ahead and uh, copy the connect string, the Mongo shell connect string. Uh, you can omit that insert your password part because you're going to have to provide your password. So paste that in. You can copy the password, paste that in, and you're now connected to the uh, document DB cluster. So now that you're now that you're in, the, the lab guide is going to walk you through some basic CRUD operations on the cluster. And first thing is we're just going to see that um, that there are no databases currently in the document DB cluster because we just created it. And then we're going to go ahead and create a catalog database. Right? So we're going to use a catalog database to perform some of these CRUD operations. And because it's a new database, there are no collections. Right? So show collections, there's nothing. And so now we're going to go ahead and create a document. Uh, we're going to insert a, a document in the products collection. All right, so you see the output that there was one document inserted into, into the collection. All right, now you can also insert multiple documents um, at, in a single API call, like via this insert many. So here we're going to insert an array of JSON documents into our document DB database. So you go ahead and copy that. And you see the response is a little bit different this time. Uh, you get an array of the object IDs of all of the documents that were inserted. So we uh, requested to insert five documents. Five documents were inserted. Here's the object ID of those five documents. And these object IDs, you know, yours will be different because these are, are generated, uh, system generated by document DB in this case. Okay, so now we've got um, six documents total uh, in this collection in the prod in the uh, database. Now we can use the find API to look up. In this case, find a document where the SKU is one five nine zero two three four. All right, so we did the create operations. So here's a read operation. Uh, so we get the entire document back and we see the contents of the document where the SKU is 1590234. Right, so that's a, a very simple example of a, of a find or read in document DB. Now in terms of, of updating, uh, what we see here is we're going to update that same document that we just read and we're going to add a reviews attribute all right, and that attribute is uh, an array, and it has three different reviews in it here for, for this product. So again, provide the, uh, a field to, to find the document that you want to update. Again, we're looking for a document where the SKU is 1590234, and we're adding a reviews attribute to it. So when you execute that command, you get a result back, and you say it matched one document based on this looking for SKU 1590234 and and we modified because the uh, the document already existed uh, so we modified it okay so now um, we can go ahead and read that document again and you'll see that this now has this reviews attribute with the array of reviews Okay. And then the last thing is uh, the delete. So we did the create, the read, the update. Now we'll do the delete and we'll use the remove API. And in this case, our criteria is we're going to remove a document where the SKU is 8976045. Let's go ahead and execute that command. And we see that document DB removed one document. One document had that SKU. Okay, so that's the create, read, update, and delete. And next you'll connect uh, via a Python application that you'll download. So go ahead, when you move to this portion of the lab, connect using Python, just copy this uh, command here. 
make sure you exit from the Mongo shell first. You can just type exit. You can go ahead and paste that command in. It'll pull down this sample python document db.py script. You can double click on that and take a look at it. And you'll see that in this case, we're using the PyMongo driver. We're connecting um, to the document db cluster. And we are going to use a database called sample database, a collection called profiles. And we're going to insert some data that's defined here in this array called seed data. And then you're going to go ahead and update one of those. Um, based on the profile for Jesse, we're going to find that. We're going to update Jesse's level to four. We're going to read that updated record and write um, that record out to the, to the console here, to the terminal. So you can simply copy that Python command to execute the Python script. You see uh, we inserted that array of documents. We read uh, the document for Jesse. We updated it to level four, read it again. So you see the updated document. Okay, so that, again, that's a pretty straightforward example uh, of a Python script, but it does, uh, you know, the create, the read, and the update operations there, the script itself doesn't, the Python app doesn't do any, any deletes. Okay, and then the last thing we'll do before we head into the, um, the migrations presentation is we're going to scale the cluster. Right, so this is uh, horizontal scaling, adding read instances. So you'll go back to uh, the document DB console here in the browser. Select the checkbox next to the demo document DB cluster identifier. And from actions, you'll choose add instances. All right. So in this case, uh, we're going to go with the generated instance identifier. And we're going to continue to use the T3 medium instances. And we're not going to specify a promotion tier uh, in this example. And select add additional instances to add a, uh, a second, bringing the total uh, instances in the cluster up to three. And then go ahead and select create. And now you see that there are three instances in the cluster. Uh, two of them are still being created. And so at this point, we'll go ahead and switch back to um, the next presentation on the migration capabilities. And after that, we'll come back in here. This cluster will have finished scaling out and we'll continue on with the hands-on. All right, so we'll go back to presentation and I'll talk to you again in a few minutes. Okay, so you've just seen how to create a document DB cluster, right? You've uh, interacted with it, you know, stored some data, retrieved some data from it. But in this uh, session now, I want to uh, go a deeper into migrating data to Amazon Document DB. And primarily we're going to focus on migrating from MongoDB to Document DB. Uh, so I'm going to start with briefly considering why customers are migrating to Amazon Document DB. You're going to learn about available migration tools. I'm going to dive deep into the four migration phases, right? Discovery, planning, testing, execution, and then examine different ways to use the migration tools along with some best practices. All right, so, but first, why are customers migrating to Document DB? All right, so, you know, here it's four of the reasons, right? There, there are certainly others, but four common reasons you see here. You know, first, Document DB is a purpose built database service for JSON based operational workloads, which certainly makes it a great choice for working with JSON data. All right, second, uh, Document DB allows you to take full advantage of the schema flexibility provided by using those JSON documents. Right? You can index and query data across any of the fields in the document. Uh, document DB is architected for the cloud, right? And as you saw with the separation of compute and storage, right? You can auto scale storage and IOs, right? so you don't have to worry about managing that yourself. And then lastly, again, it is a fully managed service with consumption-based billing model, which is going to help you reduce the overall total cost of ownership. Now, again, there's four things on here. These are common sources that we see customers migrating from. There are certainly others. 
All right, but the major driver is uh, customers wanting uh, to move to a fully managed service. Um, you know, when talking about relational databases, right? They want to move to a fully managed service with a cloud-native architecture that has seamless scaling and high availability, high durability. Uh, in terms of document databases, many customers are migrating from MongoDB. Uh, we also see customers migrating from Azure, Cosmos DB, and Couchbase. And for key value customers, right, they are migrating from those types of databases because they need more flexible secondary lookup capabilities. Right. They need to look up by things by other than just a primary key. And then search, we see migrations from systems like Elasticsearch. And again, similar to key value, the driver here is when just tech search capability no longer meets the requirements and you need to perform more flexible secondary lookups. Okay. But again, we're gonna focus primarily on migrating from document databases and specifically MongoDB. So briefly look at some of the tools available for migrating. So the first one you see here is AWS Database Migration Service, or DMS. Uh, so it supports MongoDB and other relational databases as a source and DocumentDB as a destination. All right, so you can use DMS to perform full loads of your data and also replicate ongoing changes of your data uh, in near real time. Uh, since DocumentDB is compatible with MongoDB, you can use MongoDB utilities to migrate the data like MongoDump and MongoRestore. And then lastly, DocumentDB, as you saw earlier, integrates with uh, many of the other AWS services. It also integrates with AWS Glue so that you can use that to build custom ex extract, transform and load or ETL processes to transform data to JSON documents and load it into DocumentDB. Okay, so first it's important to understand the different phases uh, of a database migration, right? And we always talk to customers in the context of these four phases, All right? The first is discovery, All right? And this is, uh, you know, migrating from MongoDB is the is sort of the focus of this, All right? Discovery is about capturing the current MongoDB version and deployment configuration information, right? Determining API compatibility, gathering information about the current data set and workload. Uh, the planning phase is uh, focuses on how you're going to migrate, you know, which tools are you going to use, and what's the method that you're going to use to satisfy your requirements around downtime, speed, and simplicity. Uh, third phase is testing, all right? And this is the most critical phase. So this is where you're going to test the migration plan that you developed in the planning phase. Uh, and then you're going to test that migrated workload for correctness, performance, and load against document DB. And then lastly, the execution phase is where you're going to perform the real live migration based on the results of the three previous phases. Uh, and the link at the bottom there, that's going to take you to our DMS documentation where you can learn more about these four in greater depth. So just a little bit more on each of these, you know, during the discovery phase, all right, verify compatibility, right? Make sure uh, that the APIs that you're using are compatible with document DB. Uh, you're going to gather details on the current data set and workload characteristics, right? How much data do I have? Uh, how many read operations per second? How many write operations per second? And the reason you need to do this is because it's important that you size your document DB instances uh, appropriately when you first create the cluster. And then lastly, you know, this is where you want to start looking at your migration options, right? The different tools and how they can be used to start coming up with how you're actually going to migrate the data. All right, so during the planning phase, this is where you're going to take the data you gathered into the discovery phase and to determine those document DB cluster requirements, right? How many instances? What is the instance size, right? Then you're going to determine which migration tools are you going to use online, you're going to use offline, are you going to use hybrid method to migrate that data based on your requirements around downtime, speed, and simplicity. And then lastly, uh, you know, at a high level, this is where you're going to determine how to test that migration again and the migrated workload for correctness performance and load and then also what is the client cutover process right how how are you going to actual actually handle cutting over your client applications from the source database to document db 
Main considerations for testing, a couple of things to keep in mind is uh, use some of the tools that we've developed, uh, index tool uh, to help uh, determine compatibility of indexes to create indexes on the document DB cluster, right? This is going to make the migration uh, quicker if you pre-create these using these tools. Uh, looking at the operations log, all right? So the operations log in MongoDB keeps a record of all of the operations that are occurring modifying, uh, oh, sorry, all of the operations that are modifying data. So the reason you want to ensure this is sized correctly, because if you have a lot of data and there's a lot of updates occurring, Occurring, that's more operations to keep track of throughout the migration, right? So you need to make sure that op log is sized correctly so you don't potentially lose any updates. And then lastly, you know, if you are migrating from a sharded MongoDB cluster, uh, you do need to uh, do take some additional steps like turn off the balancer uh, and clean up any, any orphaned documents that may be out there to eliminate the possibility of any duplicate data in document DB. All right, and then the execution phase, right? If you've done all of the, or since you've done all the heavy lifting in the, the previous phases, the execution is pretty straightforward, right? You're gonna follow the test plan, you're gonna track the progress, and then you're going to inform your customers or partners uh, of the status of the migration and when it's complete. So that my uh, migration methods, right? So there's three, uh, offline, Jason talked about these briefly earlier, offline migration, it's lowest comp complexity approach. Uh, it's great for getting started quickly and for proof of concepts. Uh, online migration, that's a, a near zero downtime migration. And hybrid migration is a combination of the two. I uh, do be aware it, it is complex, but it leverages both MongoDB utilities and database migration service. Uh, it is important to understand that all of these approaches support uh, Mongo, Mongo Atlas, self-managed MongoDB on-premises and on AWS EC2. All right, so just want to spend a few minutes on the, the different migration approaches and what they look like. All right, and offline, again, this is the fastest method. But it is the highest downtime uh, because in this case, what happens if you look at the diagram, step one is right, the customer application stops writing to the database. And then what you do is leverage the MongoDB utilities. First is to dump the data in indexes with the Mongo dump utility. Uh, step three is optionally, but the best practice, right? Pre-create those indexes on an Amazon Document DB cluster, and then simply use the Mongo Restore utility to restore the data to Amazon Document DB. All right, so it is the uh, it can be the fastest, right? In the sense that you just got a couple of steps here, but um, it is also the highest downtime because the the client application cannot be writing to to either database while this is uh, underway, and it is also the simplest approach. Uh, online, uh, you see we've added a couple of a uh, couple of steps here. Uh, in this case, the client application can continue to use the source database. Um, so you see that there, step one. Uh, step two, again, we strongly encourage pre-creating the indexes. And in this case, you use database migration service with um, what we call full load meaning it's going to migrate everything that currently exists in the source database. And then it's going to, in real time, once all of the initial data set is migrated, keep up with changes through what we call change data capture mode. And then when you determine that all of the data from MongoDB source has been replicated to your document DB destination, you change your application endpoint to the document DB cluster and your cutover is complete. Uh, it is a little bit slower um, than Mongo dump and Mongo restore, but you do have near zero downtime. Uh, it's a little bit more complex. Uh, the third is, is a hybrid. Again, using both options combined. Uh, so this is speed wise, it's in between the two. All right, it's faster than online, but not as fast as offline. Again, near zero downtime, but it is the most uh, complex. And the reason it's faster than online is because you are using Mongo dump to dump the existing data, pre-create those indexes, use Mongo restore to restore all the data to the document DB cluster, and then use database migration service to just replicate any changes that may have occurred while you were doing Mongo dump and Mongo restore. Again, key point here, near, uh, really 
near zero downtime, really no downtime. All right, the application can continue to write to MongoDB source. And then you still need to turn, you will determine that all of those changes are now present in your Amazon document DB database. And the, custom, the client application will cut over to document DB. Okay, and just to round out here, uh, a couple of best practices. You see a couple of links here. These are tools, uh, open source tools that we have developed. Yeah, so they are not officially supported by AWS, but the specialist solution architect team that I'm part of, right? We do develop these and can certainly help you if you have any questions, all right? But one, you know, certainly use the, the tool to verify API compatibility, right? It's, it's really easy to run and I'll give you uh, pretty quickly, give you uh, a report of if you're using any un unsupported APIs or operators or aggregation stages, all right? My uh, size your cluster based on your needs. Again, this is part of the migration um, phases in general, but uh, we do have tools to help with that, right? So based on the information you gather about data set size, workload characteristics, uh, we have sizing tools that you can use that will provide you the optimal configuration of your document database cluster based on those inputs. Right? And that's gonna allow you to estimate those costs prior to, to the migration, right? So you don't have any surprises after, you're, after you've got everything migrated. Again, create the indexes prior to the migration. It's a lot faster to create those indexes and then load the data than trying to load the data and create the indexes after the fact. Use the tool for that. Uh, talked about the operations log, right? So best practice is ensure your MongoDB operations log or op log uh, can handle uh, keeping up with all of the changes that are occurring during the migration so you don't lose any. Something to consider, uh, best practice six, is even though you size your document DB cluster, consider scaling up the primary instance to a larger size, uh, depending on the amount of data you have to migrate. All right, that's going to larger size instances are gonna handle more concurrent connections, gonna allow you to migrate data faster, and then scale that back down after the data has been migrated. And this applies to the, uh, the online and, and hybrid methods. Uh, Certainly take advantage of any tunable parameters to speed up the migration. If you're using database migration service, uh, leverage a capability called segments, which is gonna break up and parallelize the load of data. All right, so instead of just trying to sequentially migrate 10 terabytes of data, we'll segment that 10 terabytes into smaller segments and migrate those segments in parallel. If you're using the offline or the hybrid approach, uh, you know, leverage the settings with Mongo Restore uh, to set different options to match the number of vCPUs on the primary instance in your document DB cluster, right? So you can get the most possible throughput, and get that data migrated as fast as possible. Uh, number eight, lastly, you know, don't migrate indexes and data that you don't need, right? It may sound kind of silly, but you know, do take the time and, and just make sure uh, you know, do some evaluation. If you don't need it, don't migrate it. Lastly, testing is not optional, right? Again, the more time you spend in the three phases prior to the, uh, the final migration, that migration is just gonna go a lot smoother. Okay, so with that, yeah, thank you for your time. And we'll now transition into the next hands-on lab where you'll see how to actually uh, do one of these migrations. All right, so real quick, just to wrap up that first lab. All right, if you were following along and working on it, you'll see that the demo document DB cluster is now scaled out to three instances. And really just one last thing to do for that particular lab is to, is to go ahead and, and delete it. Um, this will all be cleaned up automatically at the uh, you know, Thursday morning when, when these environments go away, but more just to see how do you actually delete a cluster. Um, you can go in and the, the lab guide has you modify it or you could directly choose this disable deletion protection option. Uh, we'll, we'll follow the lab guide. So you can modify the cluster and scroll down to deletion protection. So we want to disable that, meaning you can now delete the cluster. Uh, and it's gonna ask, when do you wanna apply that? We want to apply that immediately. I'll go ahead and select that again, select delete. 
and that's asking you, do you really want to uh, delete this? All right. If you do, do you want to create a final cluster snapshot in case you might want to restore it at some point in the future? In this case, no, we don't. And just acknowledging that, hey, once this cluster is deleted, uh, backups, snapshots, um, system-generated snapshots will no longer be available. Uh, certainly any manual snapshots you've taken will be available. But in this case, okay, we're good with that. Let's just delete it. All right, and then that'll take a, a few minutes to, to delete. All right, so the next portion of the hands-on that we're going to work on for the, the remainder of the session here until the top of the hour is migrating from MongoDB to DocumentDB using database migration service. All right, so you've, you've just seen uh, you know, different, different methods in this lab. We are using uh, database migration service or DMS to do this. All right, and you'll, you'll see how to create uh, the different resources uh, required for, for that migration. All right, so here's a uh, similar to what we had before. This is what the, the solution looks like. All right, we have an Amazon Document DB cluster in the VPC. We've got that Cloud9 instance. Um, in this case, you're going to be using DMS and there's a Lambda and this has all been pre-created. All right, there's a, a Lambda that runs periodically uh, to insert some data into a MongoDB instance that's running in your environment. So you can see how DMS keeps up with those ongoing changes after the uh, initial migration of the data. Uh, so this is a, a high level view of uh, what's actually going on here. And what you're going to do, uh, a replication instance has already been created. Right? So within, in the context of DMS, a replication instance, uh, that's what's going to connect to the source, connect to the target, read data from the source, and ultimately write the data to the target. So that's already been created. Uh, but what you'll be doing is creating a, a source endpoint, which is really just a configuration for uh, the Mongo instance that's running in your environment. Um, the target endpoint, which is the getting started with document DB cluster that already exists in your environment, and then a migration task. Uh, where you're choosing the source, which is Mongo, the target, which is document DB, and what method. All right, you just want to do a full load of the data, like a one-time load, or a full load and replicate ongoing changes, or we also call it change data capture or change data capture or CDC mode. So you'll be creating the source, the target, and the migration task. Um, before we do that, um, the lab is going to walk you through just uh, using the Cloud9 IDE to connect to the Mongo instance to see uh, some of the data that's in there. You should already have, um, you should probably still have your Cloud9 IDE and the terminal open there. If not, just follow the instructions there to, to get back to it. And we're going to go ahead and look at some environment variables that were, that were set up. All right, so we see the Mongo user name, the MongoDB password, and the IP address of the EC2 instance where this uh, Mongo uh, database is running. So we're going to need all of that to configure the source endpoint. All right. But first, go ahead and connect to that uh, single instance Mongo database. And we'll just take a look at the data that's in there. All right, so I've connected. We're going to take a look at the um, collections. All right, we see that there's a customers and locations available. And we can get some information on each of these just to get an idea. Right, so customers uh, we can see uh, detailed uh, information on customers, but we've got a little over 19,000 19,000 documents uh, in this collection, or sorry, in this, um, yeah, in this collection. And likewise, we'll get the statistics for locations. And if we scroll up here, should be similar amount of documents. Uh, again, a little over, a little over 19,000 documents in uh, the locations collection. Okay, so we've connected to MongoDB, we see there's documents in, in each of the collections. 
let's see what uh, these documents look like. All right, so in our customers uh, collection, pretty straightforward. It's just customer information there and locations. We've got some geospatial data um, in, in that document there. All right, so now we're gonna create some indexes on the data in the Mongo database. So we're going to create a, a, a simple index, if you will, on customers, just on this touch product attribute. We're going to create a text index on this traffic from um, attribute. And then we're creating a geospatial uh, index on the locations collection. Let's go ahead and copy, copy those create index statements. Go ahead and execute them in the Cloud9 IDE. All right, so we see that all three of those indexes were created. The index on touch product, on traffic from, and our geospatial index. And we're just gonna go ahead and do a quick test, make sure those indexes uh, and everything works fine. So we're going to <clears throat> find, find customers where the touch product attribute is between 100 and 150. All right, so we see uh, some results there. All right, and then we're going to test the text index. Right, so we see the results from that text search. And then lastly, the geospatial query. All right, so we see the results from from that. Okay. So now what we'll do is go ahead and confirm the connection to the document DB cluster. I mean, we should be good. I had already connected to it previously. But go ahead and exit Mongo Shell and now reconnect to the document DB cluster. And we're just going to confirm that. Uh, we don't, that those databases don't already exist, right? So there's no databases in here. There's no data at all. So we're gonna be, we're in good shape to replicate the data or migrate the data, sorry. So there's no databases. Um, or use LabDB, which is where we're gonna migrate everything to no collections in that newly created LabDB database. All right, so we've confirmed MongoDB source has all the data, has the indexes we want to uh, recreate in document DB and document DB, there is no data in there. So this is just you know, sort of recapping the, the solution, what it looks like, but now you're gonna go ahead and configure the endpoints. So go back to the AWS console, uh, there's a number of ways to get to it. You could just click the link here, all right, or you could search for database migration service in the service search box. But I'm just going to go ahead and use the link from the uh, from the lab guide and close some of these banners. All right, so right now you see we have the replication instance right that was created, but there's no tasks, there's no endpoints. Uh, so we're going to create the endpoints and create the task. So. Again, following along in the lab guide, go ahead and click on the endpoints to first of all create uh, an endpoint for the Mongo source. So once you get into the list of endpoints, you don't have any, so create an endpoint. We're going to use the source endpoint. All right, and that's this configure source endpoint section of the hands-on on lab is right here. Okay, so identifier, um, again, it's just easiest if you stick what's in the lab guide, because uh, the rest of the lab guide is written based on that endpoint name. So we're going to call this MongoDB source, going to choose uh, MongoDB as the source engine. And we are going to provide access information manually. Okay, so if you go back to the lab guide, it's going to instruct you to get the IP address of the EC2 instance via the EC2 console. Right, so go ahead and click on the link for EC2 console. And the instance, all right, 
So when it comes up, you'll see that there's two instances. Click on that, and we're looking for this MongoDB instance. So select that, and you see the private IP address. So just go ahead and, and copy that and go back here. So the server name is that private IP address. The port is the default 27017. Okay. So we are not using SSL. We're going to use password authentication. Uh, use the Mongo credentials provided here in the lab guide. So none. So I'm using password authentication, the username of DMS user. Password is 202x doc. All right, and the authentication source leave as admin, and the database that we want to migrate is the lab DB database. All right. So next, once you've got all of that information about the source, go ahead and test the connection. So you need to choose the VPC. Remember, everything is in the lab's VPC. So we see the DMS instance or the replication instance that exists. Go ahead and click on Run Test. Uh, it's probably take about 30 seconds to test it. And if everything is configured correctly, uh, you'll see down here that it was successful. Once you see that, click on Create Endpoint. OK, so it was successful. We'll create the endpoint. We now have a, a source endpoint named MongoDB source. All right, so the last thing to do here with the source endpoint, once it's created, go ahead and click on the name. And you want to go to this schemas tab. So we want the connector to go out, connect to the MongoDB source, discover the databases that are there. So, sorry, click on schemas, click on this refresh uh, icon, the inner one in the schemas panel. So click on that, replication instance you want to use to reach out, and then click on refresh. Uh, again, this is going to take probably about 30 seconds to, uh, to do this. So I'm, I'm not going to sit here and wait. Um, in the interest of time, we'll move on and create the target endpoint and move on with the lab. OK, but once it's finished, you'll see a lab DB uh, schemas. So when I configure the, uh, the target endpoint, OK, so Let's go ahead, go back to DMS, to the list of endpoints. Um, click on Create Endpoint. And this time, we want to do a target endpoint. And provide the information here. So a name, we're going to call it uh, DocDB Target. And the target engine is Amazon Document DB with MongoDB compatibility. Yeah, we're going to provide access information manually. So you need to get the endpoint. So again, you can follow the link here in the lab guide. It's going to take you to uh, the document DB console. Go ahead and click on the main getting started with document DB cluster identifier. And if you remember, we saw this earlier. You can go to configuration tab and get the cluster identifier. Actually, sorry, we want the uh, we want the cluster endpoint. Just go ahead, copy the cluster endpoint. Go back here. So that will be our server name. Port is 27017. So if we scroll down here, uh, lab guide walks you through specifying the other settings. 
So for SSL, we want verify full and step four here is important. There's a certificate that you're going to need to use. So be sure to download that. So just go ahead and click download. Just remember where it got downloaded to. And once you've done that, you'll need to click on add new CA certificate. Uh, you'll choose the file. All right, so here's the file that I downloaded previously. And use a name of CA-certificate, the certificate identifier, import it. And now we see, okay, we're using the CA certificate, uh, certificate to connect. Provide the master credentials that were uh, used when this was created. So it's lab user and this time to change. And the database name again that we want to migrate to is lab DB. Okay. So that's all of the information that is required. So similar to what we did for the source, we'll go ahead and test the endpoint connection for our destination. So choose the VPC that's named Labs VPC, run the test, and in about 30 seconds, we should see uh, that the connection was successful. All right, so while we wait for that, Okay, still reaching out. So we're gonna go back to the Cloud9 IDE for uh, a few things here. We're gonna download some of these tools that you saw uh, in the presentation and the best practices. Let's go ahead and copy these commands and go back to your Cloud9 environment, exit out from your Mongo shell. So we downloaded some of these tools here. And we're going to execute some of these. So first is, uh, to install some of the additional requirements of these of these Python scripts. So copy this sudo pip install command. So that's going to download uh, the requirements, create a directory where we're going to store the index information from MongoDB. And now we're going to run this command to uh, go ahead and get the index information from the MongoDB cluster. All right, so that's run. And there'll be two files created in this dump directory in lab DB, customers and locations. So you can double click on these and, and take a look. All right, so customers, um, you know, we see the default index on the underscore ID field. And we see right here, that's the default one. We see the index on touch product, and then we see this text index that was created. Likewise on locations, the default index on the ID field, and then this geospatial index. Okay. So now what uh, we're going to do here is execute uh, another script to check these indexes uh, for compatibility. Sorry. All right, and we see that there is an unsupported index, right? Document DB does not currently support text indexes. So we'll see how to, uh, how to handle this. Uh, so there's a, a tool to migrate the indexes and basically we can tell it to uh, skip those unsupported indexes. So copy this command here. So migrate the supported indexes into our document DB cluster. Go ahead, connect to the document DB cluster. And we'll go ahead and check the indexes. All right, and we see those indexes have been created. All right, so the next point is, or the next step is to create a migration task. 
Uh, I know we're at the top of the hour here, so I don't have time to run through it with you. But again, it's pretty straightforward. You'll go to tasks, create a new task, give it a name, choose the source that you created, the target that you created, migrate existing data and replicate ongoing changes. Sorry, that'll might continue to run. So as that Lambda runs, inserts documents into the Mongo source, those changes will get replicated over to the document DB target. Uh, just a few other settings uh, on the migration task. And then I'll walk you through creating the task. And then you'll see the task go through the creating and starting uh, and that will ultimately stay in this load complete replication ongoing state. All right, and then walk you through how to see uh, the number of documents that have been inserted for the full load and inserted because of the ongoing changes. Okay, and with that, that's the migration lab. So again, these environments will be available till about 9 a.m. Central Thursday morning. I wanna thank everyone for your time and have a great rest of your day.